Nostalgia Land. I'm Chuck Shaden, and today we're in Nostalgia Land. We've taken our cameras to Metro Golden Memories in Chicago on West Addison Street, and this is going to be the scene for a conversation about the great movie serials of not so long ago. Our guest is Jim Schoenberger, who's the president of the Cliffhangers Club, and he's brought some cliffhangers with him. So we're going to have some good fun as we recreate Saturday afternoon at the movies. So stick around and don't touch that channel. It all begins right after these messages. Shopping can be fun if you know where to go. At the Superstore, it's our policy to make customers happy, and every employee has to memorize our policy. Rule one, make TV and appliance shopping a happy experience. Rule two, if a customer is not smiling, reread rule one. Shop where it's fun, where it's policy to offer great sale prices every day. At the Superstore, we feature GE refrigerators, ranges, washers and dryers. GE appliances feature satisfaction guaranteed. Come to the Superstore, townhouse TV and appliances, Milwaukee and Alton. We're at the end-of-the-line caboose motel in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Here, a trackload of railroad cabooses have been restored on the outside and remodeled on the inside. Deluxe accommodations for rest and relaxation in beautiful Lake Geneva, just 90 minutes from Chicago. Each caboose has a double bed and a sleeper sofa, and each is an individual unit. You'll spend the night in your very own caboose. Plan now for a couple of days of fun that start with the end-of-the-line caboose motel in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. 414-248-RAIL. Jim Schoenberger is the president of the Cliffhangers Club, and since we're talking about movie serials today, Jim, I assume that the Cliffhangers has something to do with the endings of those exciting serials we used to watch every Saturday afternoon at the good old movie theaters. Right? Allow me to confirm your suspicions, Chuck. Quite right. Jim, what is the Cliffhangers Club all about? The Cliffhangers Club is a handful of fans, 13 to be exact, who 20 years ago next month banded together and decided to put together a film club dedicated to preserve the Saturday matinees of our youth. And uh, over a period of the 20 years, we've been able to locate, in one form or another, approximately 148 of the 225 sound motion picture serials that were filmed. And the serials began being filmed in 1929. The last serial was filmed in 1956. Now, before we had the sound movie serials, the talkies, we had silent movie serials, and I assume the most famous would be The Perils of Pauline with Pearl White. Quite right, Chuck. A little before my time, incidentally. Before all of our time. Anybody within viewing distance before our time, right? But how far back do serials go all together? Chuck, way back to about 1910, 1911. As far as early motion pictures are Very concerned. Definitely. And Very what definitely. Kind, what, what kind of movie serials did they have at that time? Uh, the same potpourri of uh, subjects they had in later years. Uh, westerns, contemporaries, uh, dramas. Uh, they used a uh, jungle. Jungle was always popular. Was that because the movie makers found it easy to set up a bunch of uh, trees and jungle as rot? As and that. <laughs> but of course, they, they just wanted variety. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was always the infamous masked villains. And for the, conversely, they had masked heroes. So this would bring the audience back for 12, 13, or 15 weeks. Was that the normal running time for a serial, a 12 or 15 chapters? In the silent uh, days, Chuck, more often as not, it was 10 episodes. Mm -hmm. With the invent of sound, they moved to 12, 13, and 15 episodes. In one instance, there was even a 14-episode serial. In the silent days, how long would it take to film one of those 10-chapter serials? All right, Chuck, since I've just read about those, my recollection is it would not take an excess of 12 days to two weeks. For 10 chapters? That and each is one correct. Would, each one would be how long? Uh, the episodes in those days would run perhaps about 11, 12 minutes. And when we got to the talkies, it took a little longer to it film It did some indeed. Of those. It did indeed. Because they didn't have to, all those titles and everything. We now had uh, narrative, dialogue. And the cliffhangers. And the cliffhangers, indeed. Did we have cliffhangers from day one of uh, Serial One? Interestingly enough, not cliffhangers in the sense of an explosion or a fall off a high place. Uh, often uh, just a resolution where they would run out of uh, time for that particular episode. But they try to hook you in some sense. Perhaps a look of surprise, something like this. Most of us are most familiar with the serials as we saw them in the theaters in the 1940s, and I can't hardly remember ever going to a movie house on a Saturday afternoon without seeing a serial chapter, along with a double feature and previews of coming attractions and a cartoon 
and and a newsreel. Well, maybe they dropped the newsreel uh, to make room for the serial chapter, but that basically was what it was, three and a half hours. What a wonderful Saturday that was. I'll tell you something interesting, Chuck. I used to attend a theater in my youth called the Kimbark Theater at 62nd and Kimbark on the south side. And they showed uh, two normal theatrical films. They had a western, that would be a Wild Bill Hickok or a Buster Crab or Charles Sterrett, something like this. They would have the serial. And because uh, they had four changes a week of programs, they would show uh, uh, theatrical trailers for four days. So this upped your estimate of three hours to approximately five and a half hours. <laughs> Often my mother would be at home waiting for the ransom note. <laughs> I can remember going to the, to the movies on a, on a warm, sunny afternoon in November and then sitting through all the features and the serial and everything else and coming out about three and a half or four hours later and there were four inches of snow on the ground and I couldn't believe it. I thought I had, I had stayed in the movies from one season to the next and I suspect that maybe I did. Not an unusual, Chuck. They were so much fun, those serials, though, because we could really get into it. There was excitement. You had heroes and you had villains in those Saturday afternoon serials. And, of course, they were all cut from whole cloth. The heroes all had white hats and the, and the villains had black hats, whether they were Western stars or, or Western characters or uh, uh, gangsters and police, whatever it was. We always could identify them like that. And, of course, the characters in the movies themselves, in the serials, they were, they were outstanding. Who were some of those characters we saw? Uh, more often as not, Chuck, they were drawn from the comic strips of that time. Uh, Flash Gordon obviously comes to mind. Uh, the Zorro characters, certainly Tarzan. Uh, and Dick Tracy, certainly. Four serials based on Dick Tracy's adventures. Captain America, Captain Marvel. Weren't the stars of the serials the major performers in the, in the, in the serials? Weren't they, weren't they uh, contract players at the major studios? Unless you would consider Columbia major, but at that time they were not considered a major studio. They were on Poverty Row. So you're quite right in that assumption. Were they profitable, Jim? Undoubtedly. Uh, Republic Studios was kept running for all their other features are in two contingencies, the Gene Autry pictures and the serials. The income, the profits from those two genera, they kept the entire studio running in the 30s and mid-40s. Now, where does John Wayne fit in with the... Uh, he was a Republic performer. But he uh, started out with the mascot, with the independence, uh -huh. with the independence. Uh, John made three serials, as a matter of fact. Uh, Hurricane Express was possibly the most popular, the Shadow of the Eagle. And uh, we'll, we'll have an example later, I understand, of how Mr. Wayne loved to fight as much then as he did in his later career. Now, who else among the stars, the later stars? Well, often, Chuck, uh, they would draw upon uh, their cowboy personalities. This was a very mm -hmm. big source. Uh, Gene Autry comes to mind. Uh, Ken Maynard comes to mind. Johnny Mac Brown comes to mind. They were very big on uh, approaching athletes and having them uh, appear in serials. I mentioned Johnny Mac Brown. Mm -hmm. Buster okay. Crab. Buster mm -hmm. Crab. Um, Red Grange. And for a single serial, Slinging Sammy Ball football hero. Now you mentioned John Wayne. Now we certainly can't uh, talk about all these cliffhangers without seeing some film and I know you brought some film with. Uh, are we going to see some John Wayne? All right. You're going to see a cliffhanger from chapter three of the Hurricane Express entitled The Masked Menace. This will be the last two and a half, three minutes. And it shows how John loved action even in those days and how he got into a little bit of trouble at the end. Okay. okay I'll tell you what we'll do. Now, we'll we'll uh, start with showing the opening credits from this chapter of the Hurricane Express, because that'll drag us right, right into the movie theater back 30 or 40 years ago. And then we'll see the, uh, the cliffhanger ending with John Wayne in the Hurricane Express.
Rachel when he stole the plane? Speak up, Paul Ray. <laughs> I'm giving you just one more chance to talk. Up with your hands, everyone. Larry! Else. Quick, Gloria, get the police while I keep them covered. So you're the wrecker. The man who murdered my father. I swore I'd get you. You're not going to... Shoot me down in cold blood. Why shouldn't I? You didn't give my father a chance, did you? Don't shoot him, he knows where the gold is. What's the rush, sister? No, you don't. You're staying right here till the record gets through with you. Okay, well, well, that's it now, Jim. That's it for John Wayne. He couldn't possibly have gotten out of that, right? That's it for John Wayne. He walked a little funny after that show. <laughs> you can't get yeah. hit by a train and not walk a little funny. I don't know. Now, that the villain was a real villain in there. He, he took his face off. Quite what right. What happened? I don't understand. All right. If we had the remaining nine episodes, you'd understand. The record was a master of disguise. And he often went around uh, using other people's faces and removing them at will. <laughs> Let's just say he was ahead of the other guys. Oh, okay, okay. Upon my word. <laughs> Listen, <Ooh>. Jim. Uh, <laughs> during the 40s, Jim, I went to the theater a lot on a Saturday afternoon, and I remember seeing a lot of wartime serials. And I can recall Don Winslow of the Navy. Now, did Don Winslow, did they make a lot of serials for Don Winslow? First serial, which was made in 42, was so popular they followed it up a year or two later with a sequel entitled Don Winslow, the Coast Guard. So he moved from the first title, Don Winslow, the Navy, to Don Winslow, the Coast Guard. The man was very flexible, but they needed a change of titles to identify to the audience this was a different serial. A different serial. Quite right. Before we watch a Don Winslow segment here, did, did they ever rerun the serials like they do rerun the television shows now? Very infrequently. Very infrequently. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember Republic doing it with a few special titles, and uh, Columbia did it with a few special titles. These were usually cartoon characters, however. I remember Batman and Robin, and mm. Batman was revived when they had the Batman craze about 1965-66. Went down to the Playboy Theater, sat there for six hours from midnight to 6 a.m., watched all of Batman. <laughs> no wonder you're the president of the Cliffhangers Club. Jim, I know you brought us uh, scenes or a few scenes from the Don Winslow of the Navy uh, serial. What, what have you brung us? We're going to watch the cliffhanger from chapter number four, Towering Doom, in which it shows Mr. Winslow in a particularly precarious position and how he's able, uh, we'll watch how he's able to eradicate himself from this particular problem. Okay, well now let's watch then Don Winslow of the Navy.
Okay, now for a last look at that charge. except toward the smelter. Toward on the opposite side, it'll fall toward the kill. Well, I put it just like you told me. All right, let's get back to the plunger and set her off. Got a loose connection. Okay, Don Winslow of the Navy. Jim, no possible way that he could have gotten away, gotten out of that one. Chuck, you have to understand one basic thing. Serial heroes are very, very lucky. <laughs> I, okay, well, we're enjoying some great serials here, and we're going to take a short break. Now, I want you to stick around because we have lots more to come, so don't touch that channel. Shopping can be fun if you know where to go. At the Superstore, it's our policy to make customers happy, and every employee has to memorize our policy. Rule one, make TV and appliance shopping a happy experience. Rule two, if a customer is not smiling, reread rule one. Shop where it's fun, where it's policy to offer great sale prices every day. At the Superstore, we feature Zenith TVs and Zenith video recorders. Zenith, the quality goes in before the name goes on. Come to the Superstore, townhouse TV and appliances, Milwaukee and Alton. You'll find a generous helping of memories from and about the good old days at Metro Golden Memories in Chicago. We have a complete selection of records and cassette tapes from the fabulous big band era, plus thousands of personality recordings by your favorite singers. We offer a gigantic collection of books about the movies and the stars from those wonderful days of not so long ago. 
At Metro Golden Memories, you'll find a marvelous collection of celebrity statues, plus our famous Maltese Falcon replica, the Oscar lookalike, even Little Nipper, the RCA dog, hundreds of old-time radio shows on record and tape, and lots of books about radio and television, too, posters of your favorite movies and movie stars, and videotapes of the classic films from Hollywood's golden age, hundreds in stock for sale or rent. All this and more at Metro Golden Memories, 5425 West Addison Street, just two miles west of the Kennedy Expressway in Chicago. Open seven days a week, Monday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., Sunday from noon to 5. Come in and browse. <laughs> Still have some good money. Thanks. What's the matter with you, sore puss? Still sore just being around here? Yeah, plenty sore. Well, why don't you start something? I'd love to mush you up. I don't like that pan of yours anyway. Yeah, no trouble, fellas. <laughs> there won't be any trouble, Valden. I could take care of six apes like him any day. You're taking in a lot of territory, ain't you, Farrell? Not more than I can handle. We'll find out. Surely you haven't had enough. You brute, you. Well, they really sped up the action in that serial, Jim. What the, What was that? All right. Uh, they often did that, just mm -hmm. for a dramatic impact. Uh, point of information, at this time in Jack Holt's career, the man was 51 or 52 years of age. Well, he was Holt of the Secret Service. Uh, this was very unusual in the sense they actually used the star's name in the title of the serial. This mm -hmm. has never happened before. It's never happened since. But uh, the man was about 51, 52 years of age, and I have to suspect that this was a step down for Mr. Holt. Uh, in the silent films and the early talkies, he was very much a star. And as recently as five or six years earlier, he was a major star billed under Clark Gable and Jeanette McDonald, Spencer Tracy in San Francisco. Now five years later, he's doing serials. But you had to go where the work was, and his age now ruled him out as a leading man. I would say he did all right for a fellow of those advanced years, I would say. I he would did say. indeed. Uh -huh. He did indeed. But he went on to character parts beyond that mm -hmm. period. Now, when was that serial made? It was made in 1941. 1941. They thrived in the 1940s, didn't oh, they? This, good choice of words, Chuck. Yeah. Thrived uh -huh. indeed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're going to see some more serials. You know, this is like telescoping all of those Saturday afternoons in just an hour here on television. Now, the Dead End Kids made some serials, didn't they? By all means, they did uh, three of them, three very popular serials. Uh, Junior G-Men, which was so popular that a sequel uh, sprung from it, Junior G-Men of the Air, and then they did a serial entitled uh, Sea Raiders. And this was all made in the 1941 to 1942-43 period, and they were under contract to Universal Studios at the time. Were they making their features at the same time? Yes, they were. Mm -hmm. The Dead End Kids must have been very popular to sustain audiences for feature films and then have them come back week after week for the Saturday serials. Well, I think, Chuck, a partial answer uh, lies in the fact that these are the war years, and everybody was so hungry for entertainment. The producers could get almost anybody to come into a theater to see anything because they want a relaxation from the war plans and from the tension of the day-to-day -day war life.
Well, you didn't bring any chapters of Dead End Serial along with you, but you brought along something just as good, didn't you? Oh, I'd like to think it's as good. I brought a couple of illustrations of the previews of coming attractions. The trailers. Quite right. This would be seen at the end of the main feature in your theater, and this would try to entice you into coming back uh, next week to see the first chapter of the new serial. Oh, well, I like trailers as much as I like serials, so let's watch a couple of them. This motor is mixed with a certain chemical, a product of our lab workers. <laughs> it is so powerful that just a few drops will affect hundreds of gallons of gasoline. And when our work is done, American planes will fall from the skies, helpless, destroyed. Government. Are you kidding? Give it to him. You mean for nothing? Uh, certainly. It's our government, isn't it? Stay where you are. Three down here. The other guy drove that truck away. Who and what is this Holden boy that he is everywhere at all times? Just another young American, mister, that can't be scared out by you and your rotten murdering gang. Silence!
Now those are some previews of some coming attractions of cereals. Now that, Jim, really whets my appetite to see some of these things. Now where can you see these? You, your club, the Cliffhangers Club, has showings from time to time, don't you? That's correct. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned before you only have a dozen or 13 members. This is right. So, but the club is open for new members if there is, what, an opening in the club? If there is an opening or if there is a genuine interest, we, uh, you can contact our secretary, Mr. Peterson. He handles uh, new memberships and he'll tell you how to start a club of your own. Aha, uh -huh, I see. So you can, and then you can help people find where to get some of these cereals. Quite right. Uh, available on uh, videotape as well as 16 millimeter. Primarily, film? we believe in 16 millimeter. Uh -huh. We believe the film should be enjoyed on the big screen mm -hmm. as opposed to the small screen. Well, where do you show these movies? Do you have a big enough screen? Uh, well, we each, uh, most of uh, the members have homes of their own, and they usually have large basements, and we have a cinemascope screen erected. Mm -hmm. And uh, a 13 is a comfortable amount of people to seat and to feed. Now these uh, are not mostly done in CinemaScope, though. You just no, it's just that we have the, the big screen. screen. Quite right. Ah, good. No, as a matter of fact, in answer to that question, uh, no serial was ever filmed in CinemaScope. No, I would not think so. They, they would mostly they were gone by that time. Yes, that's right. Chuck. You mentioned earlier when was the last serial done? In 1956, a Columbia epic called uh, "Blazing the Overland Trail." Uh, not a particularly good serial, but the last serial. So does that hold a special place in the, in the hearts of the cliffhangers? Only for, in the sense if you're on a trivia contest. What was the last serial ever filmed? <laughs> but not, they used a lot of stock footage at that time from earlier serials. Now, you mentioned before we had a lot of big heroes, superheroes almost, in, in some of the serials. We had Batman and Captain Marvel and uh, Captain America and the guy with the sword, Zorro. Oh, quite right. Was one of the big serial heroes, wasn't he? Very definitely. How many Zorro serials were made? All right. Uh, and there's a little lap over here because they used four uh, Zorro serials with Zorro in the title. And they used uh, two uh, spin offs in which the Zorro character was used. But because the rights were possibly expired by that time, uh, they would use the costume, but different titles like Man with the Steel Whip and Don Devil Rides Again. These are deli uh, deliberate rip-offs of the Zorro character. Mm -hmm. Well, up to now, we've been just watching more or less cliffhangers from some of these various serials we've been talking about, but we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we have a complete episode uh, from one of these Zorro serials. Is that right? Zorro's Fighting Legion, one of the very best of the Zorros, if okay. not the best. Ter okay, terrific. Now, we're going to take a short break. I'm Chuck Shaden. Jim Schoenberger is our guest. We're talking about serials and cliffhangers, and you're part of it, so stick around and don't touch that channel. The Mysterious Traveler. The Jimmy Durante Show. X, 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 minus, 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 one, one, one. Fibber McGee and Molly. The Amos and Andy Show. Suspense. Town Hall tonight. Philco Radio Time. The Tom X. Ralston Straight Shooters. The Guiding Light. Can you top this? Tom Corbett. Face to death. Henry. Coming, Mother. True detective mysteries. Some stores have people confused. They use the element of surprise and offer one-hour sales that you just seem to have always missed. At the Superstore, we feel our customers deserve plenty of time to save on TVs and appliances. It's our policy at the Superstore to save you money every day of the year. At the Superstore, we feature GE refrigerators, ranges, washers and dryers. GE appliances feature satisfaction guaranteed. Shop the store with super choices. Come to the Superstore. As time goes by, that's one of my favorite songs. And as time goes by, sweetheart, memories become more precious and harder to find. But at Metro Golden Memories, you'll find everything you've always wanted to remember. You'll see the largest collection of old-time memories in the Midwest, all designed to brighten your life with a show business memory or two. Metro Golden Memories is your one-stop shopping center for books, photos, posters, and collectibles from and about the good old days of movies, radio, and television. You'll see celebrity statues, ceramic mugs, even a replica of the famous Maltese Falcon, and even I can't tell which one is the real one. So come in and browse around. We're open seven days a week. That's Metro Golden Memories in Chicago.
Okay, we promised you a complete serial chapter now, and we have one of the best of all the serials. Jim, why don't you introduce us? Tell us what we're going to see. All right, you're going to see uh, Chapter 7 of Zorro's Fighting Legion. Now, uh, this was made by Republic Pictures in 1939, and if you were to make a list of the 10 best Western serials ever filmed, Zorro's Fighting Legion most assuredly would be at the very top. Because Republic Pictures knew that the serials, as well as the Gene Autry films, were their bread and butter, and they spared no expense. Uh, it was uh, the top actors, the top stuntmen, uh, the top, top musical store scores, the best writers for that genre. And you'll see all of these things incorporated in this 16-minute uh, chapter episode. It just moves right along, action from front to back. And it's got a good cliffhanger, I suppose. And it's got an awfully good cliffhanger, in which uh, one of the dean of the stuntmen uh, that's um, the late gentleman, uh, forgive me, Yakima, Yakima Kanut. Kanut. Thank right. you, I accept that. He, the gentleman was 90 years of age when he passed away a couple of months ago. And he does a stunt so fantastic that has never been duplicated on film since. In that's this chapter? In this chapter. And will you tell us what to look for or will we know it? You will know it, sir. We'll know it. Okay, we're going to see Chapter 7 of Zorro's Fighting Legion. <laughs>
Frank Arab's auto. Then have the others bring the prisoners through the passage. Heaven, you're safe. I've worried myself ill about you. And while you were worrying, Zorro saved us. The outlaw? Well, perhaps there is some good in him after all. Some good in him? If it weren't for Zorro and his legion, San Mandolito would be at the mercy of Don Del Oro. Ramon! Bolita! We're all right, Dona Maria. Zorro saved us from Don Del Oro's men. Oh, what did they want? They tried to make me tell them who Zorro is. Oh, the saints be praised, you are unharmed. Come, child. Has anyone ever seen you with Zorro? What? Well, seen talking to him yesterday morning, but I don't know by whom. Felipe and Manuel were here yesterday. They may have seen you with Zorro on their way back to town. But, but the governor and the commander of the militia are surely above suspicion. Manuel, eh? Someone in the council is in league with Don Delano. May even be Don Delaro. And I'm inclined to suspect Manuel. Why? Hasn't the militia under his command lost two gold trains to Don Delaro? That's right, but that in itself is hardly enough to prove him guilty. No, but if he is Don Delaro, or one of Don Delaro's men, I think I know how to force him into the open. What do you intend to do? I'll tell you later, after I've called on our brave commander. Manuel. Ah, Don Diego. I am honored by your visit. Sit down. What's the matter? Are you sure that we're alone? Yes, certainly. Sit down. Thank you. I must pledge you to secrecy. My life depends upon it. Swear that you will tell no one why I came. Yes, I swear. Go on. An outlaw. One of Don Dolores' men approached me this morning. One of Don Dolores' men? Shh, quiet. 
Someone might hear you. What did he want? Money. He came to me because I'm rich and a member of the council. I gave him a thousand pesos. For heaven's sake, what for? Why, to tell me about Don Deloro, of course. You know who Don Deloro is? Not yet. The man is to leave a note for me this afternoon with the information in it. Where? I promised I wouldn't tell. He was afraid of a trap. But surely you can tell me. No, I, I promised. All right. You will pick up this note, of course. Yes. It's to be left some distance from San Mandolito. That's why I came to see you. Go on. Well, I, uh, these are troublesome times, and I'm a man of peace. I wonder if you'd go with me to pick up the note. I'd be very glad to. Thank you, Manuel. I'll call for you later. Uh, Diego. Of course, there may be nothing to it. The man may not even leave a note. There's no need to take anyone else with us. As you think best. Which of the men plans to betray Don Deloro? I don't know yet. But there's still time to stop him. He is leaving a note for Don Diego, some distance from San Mendelito this afternoon. That note will contain the secret of my identity. Until I overcome this feeble republic and become emperor of Mexico, it is vital that my identity remains unknown. Get that message and bring it to me. all about Don Delora. Open it. No. This note should be open at the council meeting. Stand still. And don't turn around. That note won't be opened at the council meeting. I'll take it. Shall we fight? No. Marino has us covered. I'll gladly pay you well if only you... Quiet! And don't try to follow us. Well, we're no better off now than we were before. Oh, yes, we are. What do you mean? There's some questions you'll have to answer. How did you know it was Marino who held us up when your back was turned so you couldn't see him? Why, well, I... Uh... You must have told Don Dolores' men that we were coming here. Why, you... Now, wait a minute. Take it easy. I'm as steady as a rock. I'm sorry, but I've got to take you back to the council. Of course. Anything you say. You're not going to read it. Don Deloro will kill you. But we'll tell him the message has already been opened. It may be to our advantage to know his secret. Well, there's nothing on it. It's a trap. Come on. hardly proves Manuel to be guilty as you charge, Diego. But, gentlemen, he was the only one to whom I mentioned that message. And yet we were waylaid and the message taken from us. He knew it was Marina who was holding us up before he saw him. He must be Don Delaro. He's right. It sounds like it. It certainly looks that way. How do you answer this? All right. This is the way I answer. Stay where you are. Don't anybody make a move toward me.
squad. Well, that was Chapter 7 of Zorro's Fighting Legion. And, Jim, I assume Chapter 8 has got to be the funeral services for Zorro because there's no way he could have survived that. He, no way he could live after that. Not unless you were Yakima Canut. <laughs> he did the stunts. He did the stunts. He did the stunts. He did the stunts. Well, we saw all of Chapter 7 of Zorro's Fighting Legion, and uh, there's no way, there's absolutely no way that Zorro can get out of that. But you brought the beginning of Chapter 8 along with you, didn't you? I'm tricky that way. Yes, I do, Chuck. And we can see how it got out of it, right? I think that'll be fine. And, and we'll do that right after we take a break. Now, stick around. Don't even go out for popcorn. We'll be right back. Some stores have people confused. They use the element of surprise and offer one-hour sales that you just seem to have always missed. At the Superstore, we feel our customers deserve plenty of time to save on TVs and appliances. It's our policy at the Superstore to save you money every day of the year. At the Superstore, we feature tap-in gas ranges, tap-in for cook-easy, clean-easy features, plus continuous or self-cleaning ovens. Shop the store with super choices. Come to the Superstore, townhouse TV and appliances, You'll find a generous helping of memories from and about the good old days at Metro Golden Memories in Chicago. We have a complete selection of records and cassette tapes from the fabulous big band era, plus thousands of personality recordings by your favorite singers. We offer a gigantic collection of books about the movies and the stars from those wonderful days of not so long ago. At Metro Golden Memories, you'll find a marvelous collection of celebrity statues, plus our famous Maltese Falcon replica, the Oscar lookalike, even Little Nipper the RCA dog, hundreds of old-time radio shows on record and tape, and lots of books about radio and television, too. Posters of your favorite movies and movie stars, and videotapes of the classic films from Hollywood's golden age, hundreds in stock for sale or rent. All this and more at Metro Golden Memories, 5425 West Addison, just two miles west of the Kennedy Expressway in Chicago. Open seven days a week, Monday through Saturday from 10 to 6, Sunday from noon to 5. Come in and browse. We're at the end of the line Caboose Motel in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Here a trackload of railroad cabooses have been restored on the outside and remodeled on the inside. Deluxe accommodations for rest and relaxation in beautiful Lake Geneva, just 90 minutes from Chicago. Each caboose has a double bed and a sleeper sofa, and each is an individual unit. You'll spend the night in your very own caboose. Plan now for a couple of days of fun that start with the end of the line Caboose Motel in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. 414-248-RAIL. 
Well, before the break, we saw the complete Chapter 7 of Zorro's Fighting Legion, and we just can't let that happen to Zorro without finding out what happened. Jim, you brought along Chapter 8, and we're going to see a little bit of that to see how that cliffhanger was resolved, right? Quite right, Chuck. Now, Yakima Kanut was the stuntman for Reed Hadley, who was portraying Zorro, and what was the predicament that Zorro was in here? Well, the villain was escaping on his stagecoach. Zorro catches up to him, transfers to the horses, trying to get back to the stagecoach. The villain leans out the window, fires the gun. Zorro drops beneath the horses and does an amazing somersault underneath the thundering hooves of the horse. And it appears inescapable, but uh, due to the agility and the ability of Yakima Kanut, he was able to allow the horses and stagecoach to pass over him, grab the rear of the stagecoach, and climb back onto it again. And the stunt simply has never been duplicated again. It was too dangerous. Okay, let's watch it. And Zorro rides again, and that's how he got out of that predicament from the end of Chapter 7. But this is Chapter 8, and, you know, in a few minutes, boom, he's going to be in another problem situation, and it's going to happen all over again. Isn't that right, Jim? A new peril, a new cliffhanger. <laughs> well, these serials are all so much fun, and I hope, Jim, someday we get a chance to sit down again and look at some more of the great cliffhangers. Yeah, that would be fun for me, too, Chuck. Thanks very much for being with us today, Jim. Thank you, Chuck. And I thank you for joining us today, too for another edition of Nostalgia. at a time.